with me is going to come up uh, four different speakers. So we have Tom Fish. He's the head of public policy and research at Generate. We have Noah Rafalco. He is the CEO of TCG, TSG Global. Nicholas Venzia, who's coming in via Zoom. Unfortunately, he had a family emergency, so couldn't fly in for us. So at least he's zooming in with us. And we have uh, St. John, St. John Deacons, founder and CEO of Citizen Me. So gentlemen, can we get uh, invite Nick up too, so we have him, even though he's virtual? Um, okay, so we'll wait for Nick to show up. Hopefully he'll come soon, but let's kick things off. So <clears throat> this session is about shifting power from the platform to the people. And I think one of the things that we've been talking about all day is this idea of and endowing a, a credential to people, you know, whether or not that be organizational or whether or not that be individual. But regardless of the experience, I think one thing we're learning is that up until now, I'd go onto the internet and the, the internet would give me my identity. The platform provider would give me my identity. That's being totally reversed and I'm bringing my identity to the platform. And I think that's gonna fundamentally shift and change the game and the nature of data. So with, with that in mind, let me kind of uh, start with um, Tom a little bit. So Tom, you, you've built a browser that basically lets people take control of their, their st browse stream data and actually monetize it. Can you talk to us about that? And, and what does that really mean? Yeah, so Generate, um, we're essentially a personal information management service or, or PIMS as they're often known. Um, and we deliver this through a, a range of products. One of them is the, the browser and browser extensions on, on desktop. Um, and on mobile, we've got a sort of, uh, sort of data management app. Um, so the browser on desktop, um, we, give, we give our users really a, a sort of simple choice. We offer them a choice between privacy mode or rewards mode. Um, and there's something similar, similar in, the, in the app as well. Essentially what we say is, look, if you want privacy mode, we can block, block cookies, block trackers, block um, annoying ads, um, and you can browse uh, in a sort of private environment. When I use the rewards mode, um, what we say to them is, look, if you want to opt in to sharing your data with us, whether that's on the browser, uh, directly their browsing data, or in app, data that's from third party services like Amazon, Google, Netflix, Safari, uh, Google, Gmail, or Amazon. Amazon. What we say is, we will put that data to work for you, and we will pay you a return, um, just like people expect today with their bank, when they have their money paid into a bank, they trust that bank to look after their money for them, they trust that it will kept, be kept secure, and they, they expect a reasonable return at the, at the end of the month, the end of the year, through interest. That's how we think about um, personal data, that's what we think the future of personal data is, and that's, that's the future we're building with our So ourselves. personal data is a currency then, in that regard? I, I think that's, um, we think that's the future, that's how people are gonna start to see, see data in the future, and okay. that's how they're going to, um, yeah, expect, expect it to be looked after for them. So now let's keep going down the line. So Sinjin, you've been like a godfather in this, in this industry in the <laughs> sense that you helped birth the concepts of personal information. I should information. have brought my cotton wool. My yeah, yeah, exactly. But helped birth right. the concepts of personal information management systems or PIMS with Citizen Me. And this concept that, you know, we've got all these smart wallets we've been talking about and these keys that are holding authentic data that stores provenance. But there's a lot more data in my life exactly. beyond just... Yeah, yeah. These, these well, it's, it's, I mean, it's fascinating because the previous session was all about Internet of Things yeah. and what we're moving into really is Internet of People, right? Right, which <clears throat> was kind of coined by Zuckerberg about ten years ago, and kind of he tried to make out that we're all connecting the world and everything else. But basically, what you're really doing is chucking all the data into a big silo. Uh, if Facebook is here, just talk to them. Mm -hmm. um, so what you're really doing is basically throwing data into a big silo. So what we're doing at Citizen Me actually similarly kind of aligned, and I think there's a big movement of us that are moving in this direction. Uh, we're enabling people to gather their own data onto their own device, into their own smartphone. Uh, we've got about 400 data types at the moment. We've got about 1,000 data types by the end of the year. We have kind of things like Apple HealthKit integration through to Spotify, etc. Uh, as well as having data on the edge, we also have uh, AI on the edge. So we run algorithms in device so we can tell you your mood. You've been joyful for the last month according to your Spotify playlist. Uh, or a kind of personality insight. And the driver for that is um, really about kind of enabling the data to provide people with better life outcomes in their domain, where the domain, the, the data staying where it is, and we shift the algorithms to where the data is. That creates a huge amount of value that people can then choose to use in different areas of their life. 
Uh, we started off similarly, basically enabling people to kind of do that on the Citizen Me app. We've got Citizen Me personal data exchange. Uh, what we found with COVID is we're being approached by a lot of companies to actually just embed this tech into their existing customer data stacks. Interestingly, primarily in the US, uh, where companies have built out large customer data environments and you've got a 360 view of how your customers touch you as an organization. The interesting thing we can now do is give individuals the 360 view of their own data and how, how they kind of progress in terms of data through their lives. Uh, critical to that is, of course, is identity. So we also run things like, um, you know, we, as well as running a recommender zone in-app, we also run uh, veracity checks. So we triangulate on different data points. And we can tell you that someone who says they're in New Jersey is actually in Ho Chi Minh, because we can see their operator ID and their phone language and everything else, GYP, et cetera. So as, a, as an industry, we're now about to sh make this massive shift. It's interesting for me that the US is really driving that. Thank you. Um, so we're moving into a space where, with the regulation that's coming through, there's going to be this massive kind of change in the, the, the power of data and the internet to individual people. Well, and a couple of comments that are coming to mind. I said, you know, like you just launched a whole medical product line like last week or something like that, right? Where my diabetes data can go in. Yeah, we're, we're working with a diabetes charity, so type 1 diabetics can pull their own. I love this one. Um, they can pull their own uh, glucose information onto their own device, which they can do already with something like Dexcom or Abbott, which is kind of a wearable that people have in their arm, but they can also overlay uh, their step count and their sleep and their daily energy expenditure and you know, anything else in their life that they want to stream on top. And if someone has a, you know, weird glucose levels on a Tuesday, they can look back and say, see, they didn't have enough sleep on a Monday night. And they can then share that anonymously with a thousand other type one diabetics and they can all see that actually when they don't have enough sleep, there's an issue the next day. So that there's kind of this collaborative learning right. through anonymized data. So there was a lot there. You guys are all going to have to re-listen to that, like bring the data to the algorithm, or algorithm to the data, things like that. So we move from monetizing data to start controlling all of my data. to now I want to pop up to Nick, and then we'll, we'll come back to Noah in just a second. So Nick's doing something really interesting, and he truly is moving the power from the platform to the people. And so Nick, can you talk to us about this idea of the creator owning their creation and the audience getting actually rewarded for participating in the podcast models you're doing? And how's the role of the brands that are playing, it, playing with that? Yeah, so one of the missing areas, for example, in the whole world of ad tech and media mixed modeling is actually podcasting, it is being able to actually connect to a podcast listener. So until that's able to be done, you know, the, person can actually be connected to through podcasting within Apple and Spotify's ecosystem, big brands don't want to come to play because they have, don't have those analytics and insights. So what we've done with podcasting is actually started to connect and build out an identity graph where we can actually identify who's listening to what podcast. This now creates an entirely new level of relevance because now audio consumption is a much higher level of intent versus say someone who just clicked an app or clicked a topic. But if you listen to the same podcast, same type of interest in that podcast every time, which is pretty top level, pre-COVID, during COVID, and it's post-COVID era, it's a way we can validate and verify that that interest is still relevancy to that individual. And this allows us to actually use podcast team. Okay, so tell us a little bit about that, though, in the sense that so if I'm, if I'm like listening to a sports podcast, that sports intent is now being fed in, into real time for real time advertising and much more relevance than we would have had before. Well, it's not just relevance, but it's not, we're not focused on the ads that are running on air. We're trying to help the creator economy make money from the 10 other ads that now that these people are going to be exposed to. And Google and YouTube. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, so like YouTube's always been, you know, learning from the content people consume. However, this creator is only taking on one app, two ads that are running during on the content. Even though the topics are, you know, that are being discussed or issues on, say, that creator's content are then being categorically assigned to the viewer to go allow brands to re-engage with that viewer. However, it doesn't pay the creator. So, so what we've now learned then is we go from person owning their own browsing data to person owning their own data pool and their own data sets to now the creators of content having rights over the data that their podcast is producing. And then now that we've mapped to the audience, 
the audience now can actually participate in that revenue exchange and share, and that's where I want to come to you. It's like, how do we do that? And what's the role of a mobile phone number and some of these other identifiers that will help us tie all these pieces together? Sure. Um, there, it's more about the interoperability, though, actually, right. on an identifier. Right. 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 It's not just the mobile phone number. It's having a directory that can interoperate across all <laughs> ecosystems, even at an IMEI level to a mobile IP, to a wallet, to a you know, mobile phone, to an Instagram handle, to a Twitter handle. It's that directory and that database of who's who. That way, everyone can start to actually talk. Right, and no, how is this disrupting everything? As, a pe as people, people and the creators start taking more control. Well, it's interesting you asked that because coming to England was very interesting as, a, as, a, as an example. Uh, let's just look at the past few decades of information building. And it starts with uh, the last two years have produced 92% 90, of our data that exists today in two years. So imagine what that's going to create as IoT explodes to with a combination of population expansion estimates and IoT device expansion. We're going to be at about the 30 billion uh, endpoint discussion level in about six, seven years. Mm -hmm. So when you think about that, you think about, okay, where do we start? We started giving our data away. So, you know, when you were talking about Facebook, Facebook is a repository that you're feeding. You're feeding this other place. And what is that doing? That's helping them grow. So let me bring it back to the, the English example. Uh, I come from New England. I come from Boston. And how a lot of people made it to the new world now remember that, the new world, because there's a new world coming, is they did this thing, at, one of the systems they had was indentured servantry, where you exchange travel for land. You'd work, you'd get travel, you'd work their property, and then you'd own that property after a certain period of time. And I think that that's a brilliant correlation here because that's exactly where we are today. We started by giving our data away to get something back. What did we get? We got applications, we got simplif simplified, less frictioned. Uh, anything that we did was less friction because people were making it more efficient because they saw way before us that the data was going to be the most important thing that they could capture. Uh, so looking at companies like Google, uh, they're not a search engine company, are they? So you have to imagine where this is taking us. So when you think about turning this into a monetary side, you're flipping the, the you're, you're shifting the entire paradigm shift happens to saying, listen, we're dealing with so many data points right now. If we're expecting a third party to deal with those data points, they're not going to do it as well as us. Well, and it's not just about monetization, though. As you were saying, it's about values. Like, I'm living a better life. Yeah, you know, exactly. and that you're, for you, it's a more sense of control. I can either have my private, or if I'm not private, I'm actively exchanging. And then, Nick, if you can comment, too, a little bit, you know, brands want this too. So you're, you're working with some major, fairly large consumer facing brands that are buying into this ecosystem that we're okay with doing value exchange with the individual and with the creator. So can you talk to us a little bit about where you see this going? Well, actually a great example is Starbucks. Starbucks is a bank. It is literally a bank of data. And people have, it's got the digital currency, it's got rewards. It literally is able to take people from cash to device used to redeem and store. Starbucks is an actual working model if you think about the app. And, and the amount of money that's sitting there in, in, in points that people actually put cash in for. And what's important with this is that the Starbucks model is, is really actually a tipping point. So you should, if you want to look for a forefront brand, Starbucks actually ties it to IMEIs. Starbucks actually ties it to pretty good modeling. And that's why you see a push notification on your device based on proximity. The next evolution for Starbucks to go to will be, though, that creator becoming involved in whatnot. So we're going to see a lot more relevancy coming in the custom tailorization, and I think the creator economy is going to be a really good to jumpstart that because attribution will finally be here. And uh, Cindy, you're smiling a little bit as you hear this. What are, what's going uh, through your It's head? really fascinating when you look at things like loyalty programs with, say, Starbucks, and they've kind of brought out NFTs, and although they've now dropped the term NFT, but it's kind of an NFT. Under the hood, um, it's they're basically loyalty programs and data plays, uh, and it's about kind of accumulating data to better understand individuals and then kind of share that between different parties. Um, the fascinating thing is you can now actually start to wrap that around the individual, so the individual's memory of their interaction with, say, Starbucks 
as well as Starbucks having a memory, the individual can have that. They can combine that with the other brands in their life to basically provide a unique picture of them. They become the best version, digital version of who they are, and they're then empowered to share that. Um, so that, and that's a, an everyday thing, but also when you look at creators, um, that becomes a fascinating reality. If, you, if you're, you know, the, if you have kind of between maybe three or four different creators, say a billion followers, they're then able to go to um, a brand or an organization and make basic bespoke uh, products for those followers. That, yeah. that kind of world is a, we're, the one we're yeah. about to And with like into. Nick's model, he knows who they are and he can prove who they are and there's an attribution layer that goes with that. Exactly, but yeah. if you've got the, and if you've got the, the followers basically in that loop, yeah. you're, you're basically creating uh, commerce around the, the fame of the individual and their followers basically driving the kind of, kind of the commercial loop. Right. So then big brands, big brands are different so platforms. Yeah, go ahead, Nick. Oh, it's not so much always the followers. It's the people who have awareness to that individual because that person might be driving past the digital billboard of say, it's got like, you know, a person say that their wife follows that they know of because they've seen the content before. The fact is, is that if they're able to, you're able to track the purchase from someone literally out in the world who has never bought a specific product before, but you can try to say that billboard that they pass by every day on the way to work as a touch point of who was in that creative and if what was the creator, you can actually start to do offline influencer attribution in store at SKU level purchase data. So at the you know, location, device, and I, and I think the difference is, I mean, that's not the, the scary minority report model, though, because I think where mm -hmm. Noah and as Nick have been talking about is this really is the multiple needs where I'm in control in this new model. And you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. It's a great segue. Uh, a lot of the speakers today were talking about this, where we have so many different types of personalities in the digital world. We have personal or relationships. We have relationships with people, work, communities, People we've never even met, uh, and we can we can justify those relationships. We've had them for years before we even physically meet. So you know, when you think about how you can uh, live in this world of all these different digital worlds, you have this multiple personality thing going on, and I call it the multiple me's. I live in all these different universes, where whether it's an organization where I can take my credentials into that organization, I can share it with other people, I can have it attested to other people, or when you talk about creators of uh, podcasts, and that's why Nick and I connected immediately, which was, okay, how can we give and shift this paradigm to give the consumer, instead of the brand selling to the consumer, isn't the consumer selling to the brand? Aren't you building up your own reputation in your multiple me world? Aren't you doing that on Facebook? Aren't you doing that on uh, everything, uh, LinkedIn, the more followers you have, Twitter, you know, all of this is justifiably at this point value to you as the creator. And as we've learned today, I can now attest credentials to that, verifiable and authentic credentials to that, either as an employee or as a human being to then build my own market and my own audience. Which then gets me to another point. I want to come to the policy. Okay. So there's a bunch of people-centric regulations that are out there too. And one of the core elements is the data subject access request, right? So I can go up to any brand in you know pretty much throughout Europe now, five states in the U.S. We're working on federal laws, and say, "Give me a copy of my data." And where does that go? It's certainly not going to dump into a smart wallet. So it's going to have to pop into a personal information management service like one of your players or what Nick, Nick and Noah are building. So you guys want to talk a little bit about that? How is that model going to work and how will we make this easy for people to be able to start having control of their data? I mean, yeah, happy to start off. I think a common theme cutting through a lot of the comments um, on the panel is about did find, trying to find different ways to uh, enable people to get a better deal, um, get a fairer return um, on their asset, which is their data. A critical component of that is fundamentally the ability for those individuals to access and control that data in the first place. One important mechanism for that within the legislative framework is subject access requests. As I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, and a really important, uh, really important thing um, to be aware of at the moment, uh, certainly in the UK, 
the government's bringing through uh, the Data Protection and Digital Information Bill. Mm -hmm. uh, we woven in there uh, quite discreetly are um, some quite serious uh, sort of rowing back of, of the subject access requests right. Um, enabling loopholes for sort of large technology companies to uh, reject requests based on them being excessive or vexatious or um, them needing to implement uh, sort of two month delays in responding because of um, some sort of ill-defined sort of uh, ill-defined reasons. So there's a real threat here um, within that bill um, that has a lot of great things in it in terms of um, bringing through uh, smart data schemes, um, just like open banking. Um, but yeah, with respect to subject access requests, it's a fundamental uh, right that underpins a lot of um, what's going on in the digital economy. Um, and I think it's really worth engaging with that, with that sort of threat that, we, that I'm seeing there in that legislation. Yeah, and so what I was really wanting to hope, to, and I think we're getting there out of this panel as we kind of wrap it up a little bit, in that we've been talking all of the, the whole morning was about empowering the organization and delegating identities and authority throughout the organization down to the employee. It was about the regulations. It was about you know the, the monitoring to make sure how we protect both the network and the individual and such. But with this panel, what we're finding is the tools actually do exist and are there at scale to start empowering people to be in control. Yeah? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, for subject access, access requests, philosophically, bang on exactly what we should be doing. Technically, they don't really work. I mean, who, who basically, if you do a subject access request, I think for the BBC, who are nice guys, by the way, but it takes about a week to get kind of a batch request sent to get your data back. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Netflix were a bit better, et cetera, but it's kind of, it's a very onerous, high friction task. So in theory, people have, have access to that, but it's not really, you're not caught creating a transactional marketplace. Well, so the, the, drive, the drive at the moment is to data portability, and actually the EU is driving a lot of that with mm -hmm. the Data Act and the Data Regulation Act that's coming through, uh, and data spaces and, um, kind of um, wallets and things. So that's, I think, actually kind of coming through. I, the UK government, I think, is actually behind that. You, you actually, you're actually reminding me something, too, with the BBC. They're actually just finishing up a trial with what they call the BBC Together Pod, that's right. which I don't even need to do the data access request because the BBC gives me back my data immediately into a personal data store as I'm consuming content, which then ties up to what Nick was talking about. So what if you, instead of had to click where you're seeing all this friction, when you go to a website and it says accept the cookies, go here to go look at our privacy policy and all this, wouldn't it be easier to, again, just flip that design around and say, these are my templates of what I'm willing to give as a creator? Right, so, in the, future, so in the future, brands will have to accept my terms of service. Yes. Rather than me, or my terms of access, rather than my, me having to accept your terms of service. But a great idea, I think the first thing is actually enabling people to gather their own data in an easy way, mm -hmm. and then, Absolutely, that's the world we move into. Oh, okay. I think it's going to move next two or three years. I think it's going to move very, very quickly. And it's going to move fast. So, uh, so we're going to get we're going to get the hook real quick. So, let's one parting thought from each one of you uh, from your perspective. So, for example, you've been trying to you know really understand that that universal ID number of the phone number. You want to kind of leave on that too, and how sure. we move that into the mar into the market. Sure. The phone number. Uh, the reason I like the phone number. Number one is a unique identifier globally. Number two, it's a consumer-friendly thing. They've already used it. They're using this tool every single day. Every single one of us is using this. There is no doubt that we're using it. Uh, so really, I think that the, the next generation is how can we track things better for ourselves? If we are now the brand, how can we track what's going on with our stuff? Okay. And that's why I, I like blockchain for that and love the, the immutability of that, that trail of custody. And send in funny remarks. How, how, do, how do businesses get started with this? Uh, I don't, but passing thought is basically, uh, or parting thought, uh, we talk a lot about Internet of Things, about connectivity, identity, technology, monetization, because we're all in business. But we've got to remember that the human, the human data and the human intelligence, uh, and kind of flipping the mirror and thinking all, all of us as individuals about how we want to interact with data, where the real value is for us as individuals, and how we want to interact with companies. Because... Ultimately, we're, all, we're serving those people. And if we don't put ourselves in those shoes, we're never really going to provide the right solutions. Well, and at some point, especially when my AI is working for me, hey, you might be sick, you need more sleep, your car's about to break. You know, that's a whole other panel discussion. That's a whole that's other panel discussion. Yeah. 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 Party exactly. Yeah, parting thought for me, really, I, I would say a call to arms. The, for the personal data economy, really, to thrive uh, here in the UK, EU, um, globally, Further legislative changes is going to be needed. Um, sure, there's, there's certain jurisdictions that are forging ahead, but we need to convince decision makers all around the world that 
um, as you say, consumers and individuals need to access their data with no friction. Okay, and Nick, how is this gonna work? How do people approach you and make this open graph model work with consumers' sovereignty in the middle? So companies need to start to put their foot down and stop these platforms from taking essentially information about their customers. Companies need to stand up their own environment and take control of the first party data that they generate. Because without doing that, when that consumer request comes through, they will not be able to pass back a file. There are so many companies globally that cannot join data sets as tables, yet that's that same customer in both of the files. I mean, until companies can actually take control and interlope and join their own tables and do date merges, they're not going to be able to provide that layer to them. I know right now that's exactly what we're doing for companies like Podcast One was helping identify who the listener is, putting it into a road-based system, identifying really robust analytics in ways that now the podcast host can best tailor content for their community. And it's a long process, and it's going to take, you know, I'd say three to five years for sure. And you have to also remember that people don't want to hear what they don't want to know. Data and AI right now are scary things. And it's going to be a tippy, slow process as people slowly grow to the change and understanding of the data and how it's out there. And I think you think it's going to be a little faster. Right. We're working with really big companies in the States who have got tens of millions of customers, and they're, they're rolling out in the next 12, 18 and, months. And, and BBC is not small. You know, in, no, in, in the nature but, of what they're so doing. The, the, the solid, solid guys are doing all sorts of Europe. Yeah, I mean, yeah, personal yeah. data stores. Yeah. 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 So we yeah. have a question for you right now. So we're doing proper example right now, for example, um, in a couple of the family care parents where we're starting with one identity. Um, and based off the way that they're structured, you can see that this model and what everyone's saying is kind of slowly take, is, is taking place, which is great. But it's a matter, though, again, as what you're saying on the call to arms, of everyone has to understand the importance of data and take it back to power from the platform and back to the people and those who generate the data of companies. And do we have any questions? Anybody? Are we good? All right, any questions online, Darren? Okay, well, thank you very much. We have one more session and then we're off to cocktails. Gentlemen, thank you very much. And Nick, thanks. Appreciate it.